was trying to record this spilled foundation all over the bottom of my makeup caboodle. So that's fun. Just reach down in the caboodle and get some foundation. Well, then I guess that's my expression. Like... Hi, I'm Aura Van Dank. You might be wondering why I'm already in drag. And it's because I fucking hate technology. You'll notice me mention later in the video that my camera might be broken. Well, the answer to that question was yes, it's broken. Now, here I am re-recording the beginning of my video to introduce the subject matter to you all so that you don't just start listening to me jumping directly into the content. So in the spirit of fuck this camera, let's get down to it. You're watching episode 37 of Murder's a Drag. Yeah, 37 episodes, 37 weeks. Not continuous if you've been here the whole time, but it will be continuous from here on out. That's me knocking on wood. Mercury is very clearly still in Gatoradeville because it's decidedly fucking with me now. Personally, it spilled the foundation in my makeup box. It pushed my camera over. It broke the files on my camera. This whole microphone that I have rigged up right here did not record not a single second of audio. So all of the audio for this episode comes from this shitty camera microphone. And for that, you guys can go shop at Canon and buy one of their products. You'll look good. Boy, if you'll sound like shit. Well, I have a nice, neat folder of murders and cases and mysteries that I have ready to deliver to you guys. But instead of using any of those, I wanted to dive into research again because I just had that itch for research. I found a lesbian love rhombus, okay? And it doesn't get better than that because after reading this story, my mind was fucking blown. And I know I say that a lot, but this time it really was. This was wild. Not necessarily from the start, but Definitely at the finish, it was wild. And I had to write about it and deliver it to you all for this week's episode. Even if it meant finishing my episode, coming back in here, taking the wig off, to leave it a mystery so that you guys still have that transformation magic, and re-recording the beginning of the episode. I found some tantalizing content from the 1950s era California, which has to be my favorite era of California times because everything was just... Cunt. It was A-line dresses and cinched waists and big hair. Everybody was... they were fabulous. So, I found a cool murder. Now we're gonna transition back into the video that didn't break. Podcast people, this week's episode will go off without a hitch for you guys. YouTube people, you're probably very confused. There's makeup all over my makeup kit, my camera might be broken, and this is where we're at. So let's just jump on in to this week's episode. How about that for an idea? So I had the urge to dig into this alternative case that was very Palm Springs circa 1957, and I really enjoyed that vibe that, oh my god, I just spilled my foundation while I was talking with my hands. I'm suing L'Oreal for a shitty makeup bottle. It's kind of a heavy hitter. I think that's what we, in the true crime podcast community calls well-known cases. Maybe some of you have been waiting for it. And it's no Dorian Corey, but it is the case of the trick-or-treat murder. I've seen some podcast episodes about it, but nothing from a nice queer podcast like mine. So, I'm giving you unsubstantiated theories that these other non-queer podcasts don't have you to offer for. A lot more foundation spilled than I realized, so we are really caking it on tonight, and that is okay because it's drag, baby. Peter Fabiano was a very successful salon owner and hairstylist. He was very well known because he was successful and a hairstylist, and I have my theories that he was gay and married to a lesbian woman as a beard. My unsubstantiated theories. I'll get into those theories later. Peter married Betty, who was definitely at least a little bit of a lesbian, and you'll agree with me by the end of this episode, and that is a substantiated factoid. Betty was born in April of 1914 and met Peter in the mid-1940s. They were both living in New York at the time. Betty had been recently divorced. She had a daughter with that previous man in the previous marriage. By most accounts, Betty's marriage to Peter was tumultuous, to say the least. And her relationship with her daughter and with Peter it was just strange. Peter wasn't very involved in her daughter's life. He wasn't very actively involved in Betty's life, other than just coming home to her and having her be his quintessential stay-at-home wife, I guess. 
But all of that is rumors and hearsay, and I don't want to trash the guy too much because all of it's kind of impossible to prove. Shortly before he'd met Betty, he'd actually got involved in bookmaking, like fixing gambling events, horse racing, other 1920s -y gambling kind of events and got a small charge, but that was all that was on his record, so he didn't really seem like a legally shady guy, but I definitely got shady vibes from him. I can't explain why, he just seems like he's a sketchy dude. Peter was definitely that bowler hat wearing, gambling ticket sticking out of it, smoking a cigar kind of 1920s guy. So he was definitely a ladies man. But the problem was that Betty was equally, if not more popular with the ladies, and she was also into it. Which is honestly the only evidence that I have against Peter for being gay, other than owning a salon, that stereotype. So that's my unsubstantiated theory, if anybody was wondering. It's not that great. I apologize for the build-up, but moving on. At this point, you're probably wondering, what's happening? What are you talking about? Who's gonna die? It's just a lesbian married to a straight guy in 1940-something. It's no big deal. Buckle up, bitch. Now, it's the 1950s, and we're in California. Betty and Peter decided that New York wasn't their scene anymore, it was too cold, and it smelled like hot garbage in the summertime. So they moved to California. Heard. Betty is probably frolicking around in the grass wearing a sickening A-line dress cinched at the waist. It's 1950. We're having a ball. She also, she had that lesbian bone structure that Sarah Paulson talks about in, in the, um, the Ratched show, or maybe it's the other nurse. Regardless, Betty had that, and the ladies were all over her. So what was she supposed to do? Eventually, between Peter's all-around shittiness and Betty's uncontentedness, the marriage ended up on the very rocky rocks, and the family friend Joan comes into play. Joan Rabble was a wild card by every angle. She was either an immigrant from Lithuania or born in Philly, and nobody could figure it out. All of the forums and online Reddit things that people have tried to do to, with this case, nobody can tell. Nobody knows. So she's very mysterious to begin with. Peter finds her and hires her on as a stylist at one of his salons after he finds her working freelance photography and freelance writer and says, okay, time to be a hairstylist at one of my salons. It's just very mysterious, very strange how she ended up here in the picture in the first place. And now the marriage is on the rocks and Betty is going to live with Joan. I'm thinking from the get-go, Peter hired Miss Joan and she immediately saw Betty with her sickening a line since dress, lesbian bones, and she knew it was up. She got it done. Joan at this point is ecstatic because her crush just moved in. She does have a very large admitted crush on Betty at this point because Joan has a previous marriage that didn't work out and has seen women since then and realized that she herself is a lesbian. So Joan's pumped because not only is she living with her crush, but her crush happens to also be into girls, so they're having great lesbian times living in an apartment together. So eventually things in lesbian land start to crumble because Peter hasn't left the picture. He's still talking to Betty. He's guilting her about leaving him. He's guilting her about his her daughter and saying that, you know, living with lesbians, living with the kid living with lesbians is crazy, it's bad for her, everybody's gonna judge them, blah blah blah, guilts Betty into moving back in with Peter and bringing her daughter back with him. Obviously, Joan's very pissed about that. That's her girlfriend, and you just took her after Joan had gone through all the trouble to save Betty from this relationship with Peter. Yeah, you heard me. Joan thinks she saved Betty because while Betty was staying with Joan, Betty described allegedly, that Peter had been abusive to her mentally, physically, to her, and towards her daughter, that she needed to be saved, that she needed to get away somehow. But Peter wouldn't leave her alone. She ends up going back to Peter. This all is true. I just can't exactly confirm the abuse allegations because Betty never said anything about it herself. It's all hearsay from Joan's perspective. And this is the point where I personally started to question the relationship between Joan and Peter. Because if you take away what Betty said to Joan about Peter, Joan was still not a big fan of Peter. She still was there to take Betty in. I still think that Joan's eyes were on Betty from the jump when she was hired by Peter because Betty was a stunner. I just have my, my suspicions that that Joan had it out for Peter from the very beginning. Now, considering this next chance encounter was never exactly explained completely, I've made my own origin story for it, and I think you're gonna love it. 
So, Betty leaves, and Joan is besides herself. She still works at the salon, but she decides to start taking up her old pastime of photography again. And while she's wandering the streets, lonely, looking for things to take pictures of, she turns to a coffee shop, snaps a photo, and after she develops it, she sees the most beautiful woman in the world in the photo. A woman that she can use to get to Betty. Who is this gorgeous woman in the photo? Well, this woman is Goldine Pizer, and she is a recent divorcee who is now living her full lesbian life, and she's loving it. Goldine Pizer is the daughter of two German immigrants. She was born in 1915 and moved to LA in the early 40s. She married and then quickly divorced because she was a lesbian. After they met, Goldine and Joan started getting coffee together on a daily basis, having little coffee talk times, and discussing lesbian life, the love that they were experiencing, their newfound freedom, and sometimes a little bit of murder. During these coffee talks, Joan starts casually slipping in information about her periled friend, Betty who stuck in an abusive relationship with an absolute monster who has her basically under lock and key. And she's just appealing to Goldine's incredible sense of empathy and getting Goldine more and more riled up about a man and a woman that she doesn't even know. However, this love rhombus starts to form because Goldine falls hard for Joan, catches every single feeling she can because she's been bonding with Joan every day, Joan has been admittedly leading her on like a motherfucker, and Goldine is just very easily swayed by what other people tell her, and we, we all know someone like that, who's as innocent as can be, but when certain people start to influence their opinions, the toxicness comes out and just kind of leeches through them from the other person. It's terrible. And yeah, Goldine's gullible, but I mean, she tried the whole beard marriage thing. It did not work out, ended in divorced, so she's already divorced. She got a shitty job working at a children's hospital as a medical receptionist, dealing with angry, irate parents all day, so she's not a very happy person, and if I were her, I'd also be looking for any excuse to do something other than what I have to do every day, because it sounds like her life was kind of hell. Her mental state is honestly the most mysterious thing about Goldine. It's what exactly was it about her that made her susceptible to what she did. And that was kill a person. Joan convinces Goldine that Peter is going to kill or cause the death of Betty if he isn't taken out. So Joan gives Goldine money to go purchase a gun and they start thinking up a master plan. It's Halloween night in 1957. On Halloween night in 1957, Peter and Betty have had a successful night of handing out children candy. Wait, they're not handing out children. They're handing out candy to children. I don't want to go there with them. They could have been. That's some QAnon shit. So they call, they call it a night. They want to go to bed. It's after 11 p.m. already. Peter's 35. Betty's a little older. They're not about that life anymore. After laying in bed for a few hours, Peter and Betty are disturbed by a knock at the door. And at this point, it's late, so Peter's pissed, but he gets up anyway, grabs the candy, and exclaims, It's a little late for this, isn't it? as he walks down the stairs to answer the door. Betty heard an intentionally disguised voice, who at the time she believed to be a man pretending to be a woman, answer Peter's question, No. And then she hears a loud pop and tires squealing away. She runs downstairs to find Peter unconscious and bleeding out on the floor. And this part's kind of sad because their 15-year-old daughter, his 15-year-old stepdaughter, comes in and has to call the police because her mom is so frantic. The ambulance comes, takes Peter to the hospital, but by the time he gets there, he's pronounced dead. Betty is obviously inconsolable, she's hysterical, her daughter is largely the same, and the 1950s doctor solution was, oh my goodness, these women are crying in our hospital, sedate them for a few days until they stop it. I'm not kidding. They really sedated them for like three fucking days because they were traumatized from watching her stepdad and her husband die in front of them from a gunshot 
murder on Halloween, but you know, just sedate them because they're crying in my hospital. Fucking 1950. When Betty woke up days later and police were like, ugh, finally, this sad lady is awake so we can question her now. They asked her if she knew anybody at all who had anything against her husband Peter. And without really batting an eye, still under the influence of all those sedatives, she says, Joan Rabel is the only person she knows that hates Peter because Peter took Betty from Joan. I think that's part of why she was so hysterical after she had seen that Peter was murdered in their house, because she kind of knew that it was Joan, because she obviously knew that Joan was unstable enough to kill, because that's what she told police. So I think that's kind of the explanation for Betty completely losing her shit, even though she wasn't the most in love with her husband, she was still traumatized because a man was murdered in front of her. It was rough. Police go pick up Joan for questioning, but she completely denies any involvement, and they really don't have any evidence to go off of, so they're forced to leave her alone. The investigation was feeling very hopeless. They had no murder weapon, no motive, just a name of a person who might not have liked him. But then, in a department store locker, whatever the fuck that is, must have been some 1950s shit, maybe you could rent it and it, your stuff just lives at Macy's, I don't know. But they found a gun in there and tracked the locker back to Goldine Pizer. Because she's not a criminal, she doesn't know what to do with the gun, Joan never told her what to do with the gun. All she said after they went home that night was, forget you ever met me. And then maybe, just maybe, Goldeen gave Joan back the little mask that she had on, the little 1950s domino mask that hides your identity no matter what. Goldeen wasn't cut out for the criminal life. The thug life did not choose her. When police pick her up, she tells them everything that she's done in her entire life, because like I said, she's just not built for this lifestyle. She comes completely clean, rats out Joan, tells them the whole plan, confesses her love for Joan, and tells police that she was just trying to save Betty's life. Now that the full picture came into perspective, police go and return to Joan Rabble, and they arrest her and charge her with the conspiracy to murder her husband and charge Goldine with second degree murder. So by late December of 1957, that year, the trial begins for both women. Goldine pleads innocent by reason of insanity. She says that she was coerced by Joan and driven insane by Joan to murder Betty's husband, Peter. Goldine was interviewed by psychiatrists to back up that claim, and they substantiated that, quoting her in therapy, saying, I had no motive. Personally, whatever motive I had was to please Joan. I was always easily influenced, and I've been impressionable and always trusting. She was laying it on a little thick there for me to fully believe the insanity plea, but I can't help but kind of be on their side because I also didn't trust Peter. Not to say that he deserved murder, that's not for them to decide, but I didn't trust him, so maybe she was saving Betty. Who really knows the situation there? Joan does. Or at least she fucking thinks she does, crazy bitch. And Joan was just sitting throughout the whole trial. She pled not guilty completely by reason of just not guilty. And she sat expressionless, just smiling. Well, okay, so I guess smiling, not expressionless. But Joan sat through the whole trial smiling, a creepy fucking smile, making everybody super uncomfortable and scared, solidifying her role as the mastermind behind all of this because the only person who would sit through a trial smiling like that is a criminal mastermind whose plan worked. And her defense doesn't go well. They don't believe her at all. However, the charges for both women are decreased to second degree murder for both women and they're only sentenced to five years in prison, which pisses off everybody because they were clearly taking it very easy on these ladies for whatever reason. Maybe because they were very pretty, but they were taking it easy on them. And people were not happy about that. But people couldn't have been that angry because eventually they let it go. And Goldeen was released from prison and by 1971 had become a board member in the Professional Women's Club, which was an organization serving women looking for professional work, which is like, Yay, yeah, Goldie, and I was kind of rooting for you from the beginning anyways, even though you killed somebody. I, can't, I have complicated feelings about this, I'm sorry. Joan, on the other hand, remained super fucking mysterious. There's no records of her in prison, being released from prison, dying in prison, dying anywhere, going anywhere, ever again. She completely vanishes off the face of the earth and is never seen or heard from again. That's the life that Joan lived out. As for poor Betty, whose life was completely upended by this crazy lesbian, she moved out here? 
to Palm Desert after remarrying in 1966 and lived her life out in the Coachella Valley. It's beautiful out here. I would too. And she died there in 1998, which is my birth year, which means Betty and I are connected. And I'm glad I did this story. It's for you, Bets. Yeah. This week's episode was a fucking whirlwind, but I was here for it. The story is wonderful. Like a lesbian lifetime movie about the lesbian love rhombus. You can't do it without freckles, you know? This is not a completed look without freckles. Now that I've very boldly outlined these lips, it's time to magically speed up time and be a drag queen to close out the video. And that's the finished look for this week. That statement is just as confusing as ever for podcast people. But, you know, check on the Instagram to see all the looks, all the content. You can check on Facebook, Twitter, too. I've added my podcast to a lot more places. You can check out my website to see all of the places that it's now available. It's pretty much available wherever you get your podcasts. So anywhere that you get podcasts, look up Murders a Drag. Don't forget the apostrophe. And I will see you guys next week.